If you must talk about the new dawn, the new dawn has collapsed. I can tell you with no fear of contradiction that Paul Mashatila is not the deputy president that Cyril Ramaphosa wanted. What you see is not a concentration of power around the president and the office of, of the president. What you see is a con concentration of powerlessness. Ramaphosa faces as his main challenge the problem of internal opposition. And therefore, the necessity of a coalition arrangement is imposed by the problem the EFL faces, the problem the ANC faces, and the problem that is faced by the DA. So mm -hmm. you should watch Helen Zilla very, very carefully. Spread the fire, welcome back to SMWX. And today, my goodness, cue the heroic music. We are back with the favorite guest on SMWX, a person who needs no introduction. In my view, the premier political thinker and commentator in South Africa, Ukogo Aubrey Machiki, here to dissect all that's been happening from the cabinet reshuffle onwards. Gogo, thank you so much for joining us. Togos. Togos Ashubi. Togos Akesh. So great to see you uh, in good health. And just thank you once again for giving your time for this audience and sharing your, your wisdom with us. You're most welcome. Thank you. Paul Mashadile is the deputy president of South Africa after President Ramaphosa's cabinet reshuffle. I wonder what you make of just that for starters. Well, it, it was expected that uh, Paul Mashatila would be appointed deputy president by Cyril Ramaphosa. My own suspicion is that this went against Ramaphosa's wishes. The ANC has had this curse of its president having as their deputy a person they do not want as their deputy. Um, you will remember that at the Mafikeng conference in 1997, uh, there was support for Winnie Matikizala Mandela to be elected deputy to former President Tabombeki. An idea, of course, that uh, did not coincide with his wishes. Um, fortunately for Tabombeki, or unfortunately, depending on how you, you look at it, she did not get enough nominations from the floor um, to stand for election as deputy uh, president, mm. and she withdrew. Uh, fast forward to former President Jacob Zuma. He, he was not the deputy president Tabumbeki would have wanted. Mm. Cyril Ramaphosa was not the deputy president Jacob Zuma wanted. Didi Mabuza was not the deputy president Cyril Ramaphosa wanted. And I can tell you with no fear of contradiction, that Paul Mashatila is not the deputy president that Cyril Ramaphosa wanted. This in part explains um, the delay in announcing um, the cabinet reshuffle. Because I think mm. that this is a choice that was imposed on the president. And because this and other choices were being imposed on the president, this in part explains um, the hesitation to announce the cabinet. Um, in fact, my own information, um, even though I'm not going to mention the name, um, is that the president had someone else in mind, um, had tried to interest the party um, and others in that name, 
uh, and this would have been couched under the rubric of the ANC having to elect its first deputy um, president with the view that that first female deputy president would become the first male president of the ANC. And therefore, the appointment of uh, Paul Mashatile, I think, is a choice that was imposed on the president. And I think it is a choice that makes him nervous, and rightfully so. Because I can tell you now, the discussion about Paul Mashatile should not be about Paul Mashatile as deputy president. It should be a discussion about when he becomes president. Hmm. <laughs> wow. Um, on the one hand, I guess, where do you think the the pressure for Mashadile came from? Was it from the ANC? So, uh, and then, yeah, so let's start there mm-hmm. because you say that the president acted under pressure. I mean, it's it's a mystery to many why so much delay, even though the presidency would like us to believe that there was no promise. We all know that there was delay. There was something happening in the background. Um, take us through where you, how you see that pressure and, and where where exactly it came from. Well, the pressure, first of all, comes from how the president at the 55th conference of the ANC had to consolidate consolidate his power Mm. and hold over the ANC. Now, there's an irony about what happens at the 55th conference. Um, Something similar, actually, to what happened at the 54th conference. So Ramaphosa at the 54th conference in 2017 Mm. is is elected president of the party, but cannot um, impose his will on the party because of the narrow margin of victory over Nkosazana Zamini Zoma. And so what happens to him is that for the next five years after the 2017 conference, Ramaphosa faces as his main challenge the problem of internal opposition, a dynamic that is imposed, first of all, as I said, by the slim margin of victory over Nkosazana Zamini Zuma, which means, therefore, there are certain decisions he cannot make without the consent of his opponents and enemies within the ruling party. Mm. Now, over the next five years, between 2017 and 2022, he does, to some extent, um, win control of the National Executive Committee. And by the time of uh, the 2022 National Conference of the ANC, Mm. should, and I say should, be much stronger than he was in 2017, but is not because of the palapala um, imbroglio. (laughs) But he does emerge um, as president of the ANC again because of the actions of another. So in the same way that because of the actions of Didi Mabuza, He is elected president of the ANC in 2017. In my view, it is primarily primarily because of the actions of Gwede Mandashe that he becomes president of uh, the ANC again, Mm. because Gwede Mandashe steamrolls the ANC into accepting the idea and the reality of a second term for Cyril Ramaphosa. So at face value, it seems he has consolidated his position only for him to face a new challenge. The new challenge is an ambitious Paul Mashatile, a Paul Mashatile who is much better at playing the internal structures of the ANC, who understands the internal structures of the ANC much better than Ramaphosa does. Now, given the fact that Palapala, to some extent, Mm. has denuded him uh, of the power he might have had otherwise, 
that puts not Ramaphosa, but Paul Mashatile in a much stronger position to impose his will on the ANC. And therefore, looking at the level of support that Paul Mashatile won at the 55th conference, that level of support may mutate into a new challenge of internal opposition for the president. And he understands this. And that is why, uh, not only because he was forced by the party to some extent, but also because he had to be pragmatic about whether he can avoid appointing Paul Mashatile, he understood that by not appointing Paul Mashatile, the dynamic of internal opposition by those who support Paul Mashatile mm. would become sharper and constitute a new threat, a threat that will remain, in my view, um, for the next 12 months, because I, I do expect um, that Paul Mashatile will try to position himself in such a way that within the next 12 months, if not sooner, mm. he has displaced Ramaphosa mm. as president of uh, the Republic. Because I think what Paul Mashatile and those around him understand is that the next president of the ANC, may, I mean, of the country, may not come from the ANC. Mm. Even the next deputy president of the republic yeah. may not come from the ANC. And therefore, actually, if I were a strategist for mm. Paul Mashatile, my advice for him would be if he must make moves to capture the presidency, um, he has a window of six months to do so. I don't think he has a window of 12 months. Hmm. That's just fascinating because I also hadn't thought about the calculus around deputy president post-2024 hmm. to the extent that the ANC has always been able to share power around with its top leaders. Hmm. But that window could significantly close. So even if the ANC, by some miracle, achieves over 50 or, or is in a coalition which gets it over the line to govern, mm. that doesn't mean that Mashadile stays in the union buildings if he remains deputy president of the country. Yes, exactly. Uh, especially in the scenario in which uh, the ANC does not win an outright yeah. uh, majority. Um, in that scenario, and, and I'm, I'm going to make a, a suggestion mm. Uh, that once again will make some accuse me of being insane. In the scenario in which the ANC does not win an outright majority, um, the sub scenarios, of mm. course, are that one, the ANC is part of a governing coalition. Yeah. But the president of the republic is not a member of the ANC is a member of another party. Mm. You should watch Helen Ziller very, very carefully because there is a scenario in which she makes a move for the presidency of the country, depending <laughs> on how Gogo, the coalition don't, is don't say this, configured. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of things you've said that have actually come true, I can't take this one. I'm sorry, Gogo, I can't. Well, um, <laughs> I, I understand why I think many South Africans mm. would not even want to countenance mm. such but it's absolutely um, it, it, a scenario. It's a very real, real scenario. Because Stian Hazen may be seen as too weak to bring to, to really bring together a coalition. Whereas Zilla, to be quite frank, has been around for long enough, has a brand maybe strong enough to actually say, let me lead this coalition. Well, if you look at what has been happening with regard to coalitions in Swane and in Joburg mm. in particular. In my view, the most influential actor in, in deciding what happens within those coalitions and in deciding how those coalitions are configured has been Helen Zeller. Now, I said to you, I think in 2019, that the Democratic Alliance stumbles on the idea mm. that it does not have to win 
an outright majority mm. uh, to foreground or to have its interests foreground in the sense that um, there are two ways in which the interests of the English-speaking white middle class the DA represents can be achieved or promoted. One, they can be promoted if the DA wins an outright majority. Yeah. Or they can be promoted if a party other than the DA is the ruling party, but in its orientation, its policy and, and other orientation, it advances the interests of this mm. English-speaking white middle class. So in other words, I think the DA stumbles on the idea that it does not have to be in power to advance mm. the interests of the constituency that it uh, represents, mm. if those interests can be achieved by and through another party, and in this case, the ANC. Mm. But another way in which those interests can be achieved is to go back to 1994. Now, remember, in the, the idea of coalition, people seem to think is new and is a function of uh, outcomes um, in the electoral contests in the municipal sphere. Mm. Whereas you have to go back to 1994 and, and remember that uh, in 1994, we end up with the government of national unity, a coalition of some sorts. Why? The idea behind the government of national unity was the acceptance by the national party that it would, it would not win an outright majority. So it, it talks about power sharing as a code for what it really wants. What it wants is a black majority in our politics, a black majority in parliament. But key areas of South African life would still be controlled by white people. The economy, the land, and the rule of law. So similarly, you can reenact that strategic goal of using a quasi-government of national unity after the 2024 elections, which manifests as a post-election coalition arrangement through which, I mean, through which the goal of ensuring that the land, the economy, and the rule of law stay in white hands through the reality of a political majority in our politics that is black, but unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, you don't have a party of black interests that wins an absolute majority, which means you can reenact the idea of power sharing as a means of achieving ends that are contrary to the implications of being in a country that has a black majority. So this power sharing could happen in two ways, as I see it. As you as you speak, the one is the one is that there's some kind of grand coalition between the ANC and the DA, and maybe other parties even come on for the ride, or that the DA runs an opposition coalition or leads an opposition coalition. It could actually, even if the ANC leads, I'm I'm also. Hearing if the ANC leads a coalition, mm. it still doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually leading the coalition. Exactly. And I think that that for me is actually quite so so Zilla could in fact be president of an opposition coalition or a yes. DA leader, whoever it is. But even if not, it could be the tail that wags the government dog in, Ex in exactly. a exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, another thing that could uh, happen is that we end up with the president of the republic after the 2024 election 
being one who is anointed by the DA. Mm. In that scenario, mm. that anointee may still be an ANC member. Mm. Crazy idea. Let me be crazy for a moment. But one thing that's also been happening in municipalities has been actually interesting me very much, which is parties coming together to catapult minority parties to the, to the top. And I've been wondering, yes, I appreciate it's a hugely unlikely scenario, but maybe there's such a, a deadlock in, nine, in, in 2024 that that solution actually beca- <laughs> becomes a national solution. And maybe someone, you know, that from, from a minority party that, that can kind of mm. be a compromise candidate mm. or someone from nowhere could actually become... The pres- constitutionally, they could become the president of, of the country. You, you are absolutely correct. Because, so, the, the, the problem with our electoral politics, if you are in the DA or if you are in the ANC, is mm. this. The, the, the two parties that are likely to suffer the most in the 24 election are the ANC and the DA. Mm. Now, for the DA, the fact that the ANC uh, may suffer serious contractions in electoral support in 2024 does not mean it will gain from that contraction because it has its own problem. But there are those who are beginning to abandon the DA, not all of them will go to the Freedom Front Plus. Others will go to what I call DA Light, uh, Action SA. So, so, so the challenge, strategic challenge facing the DA is, is how to arrest the movement of votes that ordinarily should come to it towards the Freedom Front Plus and Action SA in the context of an ANC that is experiencing contractions in support, which ordinarily, um, which contraction should benefit the DA, Mm. but doesn't. So the problem faced by the DA and the ANC is coincides with another problem, and it is a problem for the EFF. That the EFF is not growing to the extent that it desires, which means there's still a possibility that in the 2024 elections, um, it may underperform in relation to its own, own goals. And therefore, the necessity of a coalition arrangement is imposed by the problem the EFF faces, the problem the ANC faces, and the problem that is faced by the DA. So Mm. the three biggest parties in South Africa Mm. have the challenge of a possible underperformance in 2024, which underperformance on their part imposes uh, the reality of a coalition arrangement. A coalition arrangement which may be configured in the manner you suggest, out of which uh, the kingmaker is a small party or are small parties. Mm. It's interesting. I heard, um, so so two things um, to get your reaction to. Adam Habib, I saw tweeted, and and there seems (laughs) South Africans, you know, they don't want their coalition too hot, but they also don't want it too cold. (laughs) And they don't want it in between. And so it seems like people don't actually want any configuration because what Habib was saying was, we must keep the ANC out of power, but we must also keep the EFF out of power because he, anyway, I won't go into why yes. I think he's wrong on, on, on that. But, but, but then, I mean, what do you want? I mean, you, you can't have both the ANC and the EFF out of power and get over 50% in my yes, view. Yes, exactly. 
Then there are, are those like John Steenhuysen, uh, Gordon Hill Lewis from Cape Town who have started testing the waters to say, we want the ANC DA coalition. Yeah. So just the two of us, as it were, will be stable. And then I recently spoke to Prince Mashele, who was saying, well, what if the DA and the EFF can find each other? So that even though they come from two different extremes, maybe those extremes can cancel each other out, as it were, mm. and, and you can find a government there. So it seems that people just, we aren't sure as a nation which one of these configurations mm. we, we actually want. And it's going to be hard for the parties themselves to try and mm. divine what that coalition should look like. Well, there, there are certain pre-election messages that have become a necessity for the DA, as an example, mm. and Action SA. For Action SA, there is an understanding that support for Action SA is partly contingent on voters perceiving them as a party that will never work with the ANC. Mm. And if prior to the election there is a perception that there is a likelihood that uh, Action SA may cooperate with the ANC after the election, that may cost them at the ballot box. Mm. So to avoid that eventuality, uh, they have to design pre-election messages that obviates the possibility of contractions in support or underperformance because of this perception that Action SA may sell out mm. and cooperate with the ANC. The DA is faced with the same challenge. So we, we, we should distinguish between pre-election political messages and what may become possible mm. uh, after an election possibilities that are imposed by the actual outcome um, of the election. So these parties may go to an election saying, for example, the DA will go to an election saying, we are, we are not going to work with the ANC. Um, the Action SA might say the same thing. Mm. They might even say that is the DA there is no way we are going to work with the ANC and the EFF. And remember for the DA, that, that, that logic imposes an interesting dynamic within the party. Mm. I do not believe that the idea that the DA should not cooperate with the EFF or the ANC is totally the idea of a collective mm. that we call the DA. I believe to some extent, to some extent it, it represents the power and influence of a particular individual within the DA. And therefore what appears to be the logic of a party, the DA, is actually the logic of an individual who is able to impose her will on the collective. Now, if you come to the uh, EFF, mm. the EFF may, may occupy a very interesting position um, after the election because I don't think um, Action SA would be as strident in its view that it should not cooperate with the ANC as it would be when it comes to the EFF. So I think there is a possibility that mm. Action SA will countenance mm. some kind of cooperation mm. agreement with the EFF. Mashaba even if, had, has already done that in Joburg when yes. he was DA mayor. Yes, ex ex exactly. The rain has now started for the next section of our conversation, uh, Gogo. Um, I just wanted to also, on the, on the, cabinet reshuffle. Um, just pause for a bit to say that this was not a cabinet reshuffle. It was a cabinet mm. expansion. Mm. 
and a filling of vacancies, mm. really. Um, mm. I think cabinet reshuffle has become like load shedding. It's, mm. it's a term mm. that mm. tells you what it's supposed to be before you actually interrogate it. And the president expanded his cabinet and he filled vacancies mm. and maybe moved a few people around, mm. more in the deputy ministries, actually. Mm. Um, so Ramaphosa's decision to expand his cabinet and to expand the presidency is also something that I think we need to take note of as we think through the dynamics leading us to 2024 mm. and the election and, and that calculus. Well, because of the cabinet reshuffle, I am more convinced about certain things in relation to the president than I was before. Mm. Firstly, I, I, I can safely say that Ramaphosa lacks the courage even to be a coward. That, that's one of the things that, for me, um, comes out of what he does last night when he reshuffles um, cabinet. Another thing about Ramaphosa, it uh, reinforces, is the fact that when it comes to statecraft, Ramaphosa is clueless. And because he is clueless when it comes to um, statecraft, he sets himself on a path of re-engineering and reconfiguring government through an agenda that put Mbeki in trouble as soon as Mbeki was, very soon after Mbeki was elected um, president of the ANC in 1997. Now, people forget that Mbeki is elected president of the ANC in Mafikeng in 1997. Mm. By 1998, the rebellion against him is already afoot. It is a food amongst other reasons because there is a perception within the party that power is becoming overly centralized around him and his office. The same thing seems to be happening here. You look at the functions that now reside in the presidency mm. under Ramaphosa, and there you see a concentration of power. Absolutely. At face value. In reality, because he is clueless when it comes to statecraft, what you see is not a concentration of power around the president and the office of, of the president. What you see is a con concentration of powerlessness. <laughs> and because what we see is a concentration of powerlessness, this attempt at concentrating power and centralizing power around the president and the presidency is precisely the reason why the ANC in government will not achieve its strategic goals. Mm -hmm. And so the reshuffle um, last night, um, you are right. You are right for another reason. Um, in this way. We, we must always go back to what the post-apartheid agenda was meant to be. Mm. So it was an agenda to defeat um, apartheid, install in its place its antithesis. But at some point, you qualitatively install the antithesis to apartheid. And the antithesis to that antithesis. And qualitatively, you end up with, on an ongoing basis, with a society which is much, much better mm. than both 
the apartheid reality and the reality which replaced it. Yeah. Now, when you look at um, Ramaphosa's cabinet reshuffle, the question you have to ask is whether the reshuffle and other things he has done before the cabinet reshuffle yeah. take you closer to that goal or further away from that goal. In my view, they take you further away from the goal, which means mm -hmm. this attempt at concentration uh, and the attempt at locating so much power in the presidency is precisely the reason why we are moving away from the goals as I've articulated, mm. because it is not a concentration of power around the presidency. It's a concentration of powerlessness, precisely because the president and those who surround him have no clue when it comes to statecraft. I've just thought, as you've said that as well, that when you concentrate power and indeed powerlessness, it's easy to do, but it's very difficult to undo. Exactly. And so in 2024, if the ANC loses the presidency, then <laughs> we're going to have this coalition government which inherits this very powerful presidency. And you could have a situation where, as we've just said, someone comes from minority party or, mm. or from a party that only actually has 20 or 30% of the vote, mm. but they now inherit this presidency with four ministries and they can they actually figure out how to use it. And suddenly you have a, an unstable government with a very powerful president and, you know, we, we are left with the unintended consequences of this collapse yes. Ramaphosa presidency. So the, the, the difference between our current reality in relation to Ramaphosa and the picture you are painting is this. Currently, what, what we have in Ramaphosa is a ceremonial president with executive powers. That is different from what you are describing because what we might have after the 2024 election is an executive president with executive powers mm. that he is able to deploy. So one of the reasons why we are failing to achieve our strategic goals mm. is because at the head of our government, is a ceremonial president with executive powers. What renders him a ceremonial president is the inability to deploy mm. his executive powers, precisely because, amongst other reasons, he has no clue, as I keep on saying, um, when it comes to statecraft. Do you think the Ramaphosa presidency has collapsed? I mean, and just for context, mm. the rise of the of Ramaphoria was breathtaking in, in 2018. I mean, mm. every single journalist, editor, person on Twitter just was convinced that the second coming was, was here. And ever since Arthur Fraser walked into the Rosebank police station mm. on a June mm. morning, the president has just been flat-footed. He mm. hasn't known what mm. to do. And mm. brick by brick, this presidency just seems in mm. disarray. And, mm. and when he stood up last night, it almost felt as though it was confirmation that mm. South Africans had actually given up on this mm. presidency being able to deliver. Mm. Well, that's a good question. Mm. And uh, we, we say that when, to give ourselves time to think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a good question mm. because um, when you look at the president, you are not just looking at this individual man mm. who has ascended to the throne of the presidency. So what ascends to the throne of the presidency is not a single man or woman. It is also 
a set of interests, political, economic, and otherwise, that have attached themselves to this single man or woman. Mm. Now, to the extent that we must look at Ramaphosa's presidency as representative of a particular set of interests that have gained ascendancy, mm. uh, those interests are in, are in a state of disarray. Now, if you treat the presidency as an embodiment of the ANC itself as a set of interests, that too is in a state of disarray. Because people talk about the fact that the ANC is being wrecked by um, fractionalism. There's another way of looking at what we call factionalism or factional battles. The ANC has, particularly at the level of leadership, become a composite of individual interests. So to the extent that the center cannot hold, it cannot hold because there are too many individual interests to hold together. Mm. And I think at that level, we can talk about the, the interest Ramaphosa represents and therefore the Ramaphosa presidency itself as something that is in the process of collapsing. Hmm. But if you must give a name, and Ramaphosa gave a name to his presidency, he called it the New Dawn. Hmm. If you must talk about the New Dawn, the new dawn has collapsed. <laughs> um, so, with the promise of the new dawn, um, comes into existence this state of euphoria, mm. ramaphoria. But within two to three years, in fact, yeah. in a shorter period than that, you have the observer in. London, mm. talking about. I just love the idea of a new dawn from collapsing. Rama Foria to Rama Kedon. Absolutely. Where are we now? Mm. We have transitioned from Rama Kedon to Rama Trauma mm. on the part of those who uncritically embraced the idea mm. of a new dawn. Absolutely. In the media, the Rama trauma is manifesting <laughs> sure. as Ramamnesia mm. because the journalists who tried to sell us mm. and succeeded to some extent mm. in selling us the lie of a new dawn yeah. are being traumatized mm. by the reality of the collapse of the new dawn. And therefore, that has become an internal trauma from them which is being displaced by their willed amnesia. Because the alternative mm. is to confront the fact that they sold the country a lie. And that, I think we, we have to pause there because we didn't get here by accident mm. in the crisis that we're in with the Ramaphosa presidency. And it wasn't just of Ramaphosa's making. It was journalists, it was editors, it was commentators, it was opinion makers mm. who mm. all either conspired or by some grand miracle settled on a narrative that they were going to push. They all decided, knowing full well the president's shortcomings mm. and, and his history, mm. Mm. that they were going to back him and defend him. Mm. And now when you see that that lie really coming apart, nobody wants to take ownership of, of how this narrative was sold to us. And it feels like people have actually now crossed over and have started to criticize him mm, mm. without actually saying, hold on, I was wrong. I mm, sold mm. this to you and I have to take my portion of the responsibility. 
Um, it's actually quite sad for the president because mm. suddenly mm. all those who, who backed him mm. have turned against him mm. uh, publicly mm. and not taken any share of the blame for where we are. Well, in the same way, Ruby, you will struggle to find a white person who voted for the National Party mm. and you will struggle to find a black person who was not a supporter of the ANC. Mm. I, I think we've reached a point where you will struggle to find a journalist who did not sell us mm. the idea of um, the new dawn. Now, look at what has happened just now with, with SARS confirming mm. that they have no record of uh, this man who allegedly mm. bought the uh, um, game from Ramaphosa, mm. declaring to SARS the foreign currency used to procure yeah. uh, the said game. Now, I invite you to scan a few articles mm. um, that have been written about this matter over the past 24 hours. Mm. On the part of those sections of the media that sold us the lie of the new dawn, mm. there is an attempt to explain yeah. to the nation um, the fact that, the fact that they, there's no such record in possession uh, of SARS can be explained in reasons that do not implicate the president at all. Mm. So, so I think some sections of the media, what they are trying to do, as opposed to those who have turned against mm. um, Ramaphosa, is an attempt to rehabilitate themselves mm. by rehabilitating this failed project. Because we must bear in mind that in addition to Ramaphosa's presidency being representative of a particular set of interests, Ramaphosa himself is a project to the extent that his presidency is a project. Now, some at this point will say to me, I am alleging that uh, Ramaphosa is a puppet. And they will allege because of what I'm about to say. Um, Ramaphosa is a project, in my view, in part is a project of whiteness. It, whiteness under Ramaphosa must reclaim its dominant position in South African life. Now, to the extent that some might say, but I am alleging that Ramaphosa is a puppet. If he is not a puppet, there are too many within the realm of whiteness who regard themselves as ventriloquists. That is what may make him a project. And therefore, a puppet of the interests that have coalesced around the goal of reinstalling whiteness as a dominant social, political, and economic reality in South Africa. Hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange time we find ourselves in because the president and the presidency is, it's reached that level that so many South African presidencies reach of incoherence mm. of of just saying things that that just do not accord with the reality of South Africans. Mm. Mm. And when you get to that stage, I often wonder what is it about the South African presidency itself that that devours its incumbents so mm. readily. You know, mm. there was a moment in the Mbeki presidency where you just knew reality is no longer quite as close as it mm. used to be. 
Mm. We know it happened with the Zuma presidency. The Ramaphosa dissent has been swifter, probably. Mm. Mm. But I wonder what it is about that office that that just claims its victims before they can ever mm. claim the presidency. Well, to, to, to the extent that we can talk about the ANC having had a radical mm. tradition, um, there, there has been an attempt from the time of Nelson Mandela to extricate the ANC president from the ANC as something that has the potential to impose on the country a radical vision for the future of the country. And, and I say potential because for the most part since 1994, the ANC as a radical option has existed more in the realm of hope and aspiration uh, than a reality that seeks to change our social, political, and economic fortunes. So there's that first challenge mm. ANC presidents have faced, the mm. attempt to extricate themselves I mean, to the, the attempt to extricate them yeah. from the ANC as a political and ideological reality. And if you look at each president since 1994, um, there, there has been some level of success, depending on which president you're focusing on. Sure when it comes to this attempt. Sure. For instance, Nelson Mandela becomes a buffer zone between white fears and black aspirations. Thabo Mbeki posits a different idea of what constitutes reconciliation. He argues that unless the material conditions of those who are victims of colonialism and apartheid are changed and changed fundamentally, there can be no reconciliation in this country. And to some extent, therefore, there is less success to extricate Tabombek mm. from the ANC as a reality. Yeah. The irony, though, is that even as he posits this understanding of reconciliation, he is not fully representing what the ANC has become at that time. Um, so that's the first problem, this attempt to extricate the ANC yeah. president from the ANC um, as a reality. Now, Thabo Mbeki um, famously said, lies of short legs. My, my own take on that is, they may have short legs, but they can walk for a long time. And, and, and lies about our post-apartheid reality, which is a neo-apartheid reality, have walked for a long time. I've been walking for 30 years since 1994. Mm. And the incoherence you talk about is a, an incoherence that is a function of the fact that this revolutionary movement, the ANC, this liberation movement, the, the ANC, has become something contrary to what its revolutionary goals were and are supposed to be. And so to some extent, this revolutionary movement, this liberation movement, has become an ally of whiteness and an ally of coloniality, which causes an identity crisis for those who are elected to become its leaders. And because of its dominant position in our, in our political landscape, presidents of the republic. Mm. So you have a president of the republic who is an ANC leader, 
who is supposed to, to be the leader of the project of fundamental transformation mm. in social, political, and economic terms. But he is the leader of a movement that has become an ally of coloniality mm. and whiteness. Mm. And the incoherence comes from the fact that in trying to deny that post our post-apartheid reality is a neo-apartheid uh, reality, the ANC must convince us that it is what it is not. And therefore, the incoherence of ANC presidents, including this one, mm is the attempt to convince us that the presidency of a Ramaphosa and the ANC itself are part of a revolutionary agenda when that is no longer the case. How do you read the Dureta resignation furor against this context of um, the backdrop of whiteness and how it's working in the Ramaphosa Era. Of course, Dereta himself, being a white man in such a public position, mm. has attracted a lot of commentary, um, fair and unfair. But the symbolism of that has been key to a lot of the political tension over mm. the last few mm. months. And then he resigns, but doesn't quite resign. And then the bombshell with the Annika Larson interview. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, I... I may be wrong, but I don't think the Annika Larson interview and its timing were innocent. Um, watching the interview carefully, I could not completely run away from the feeling that we as the audience were being managed and were being managed as part of a broader process of political manipulation to create a false consensus about the rater. Mm. Now, if you look at responses to the interview, particularly his his allegations of corruption. You have, in the main, white male commentators who characterize him as a hero, who characterize him as a victim, who refuse to accept that he is probably the most ineffective and inefficient CEO ESCOM has ever had. But that imposes a crisis for whiteness. Because remember, whiteness is governed by the white male and in a way is a product of a particular variant of the toxic masculinity of the white man. Now, if you go back five, six, six centuries, centuries ago, this particular toxicity of the masculinity of the white man manifests as what was called the Enlightenment and modernity. Um, a characterization that ignores the darker side of this enlightenment, the darker side of this modernity. Because the darker side of this, of this modernity and enlightenment has a particular logic about those who are not white. They are, they are epistemologically and ontologically inferior. Now, remember another thing. It is the black person who is a man, who is ontologically inferior and epistemologically inferior in this way. So the logic of whiteness tells us 
tells us that black people are inferior um, at both those levels. Now, the white woman is, is ontologically, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the black woman is ontologically inferior for two reasons. By virtue of being black. So to be black is not to be human. <laughs> And therefore, by virtue of being black, the black woman is not human. But to be human is to be a man, whether black or white. Which means the black woman is not human because she is not a man. Now, there are certain things which go with blackness in contradistinction to whiteness. Firstly, to be white, and therefore to be a white man, is to be ontologically superior and epistemologically superior. That means there are certain things that are inherently white. Competence is inherently white. Therefore, to be incompetent, lazy, corrupt, and to succumb to base human, they might say inhuman instincts, is to be black. And so to accuse the Rata of being incompetent and inefficient is to accuse him of being black. So in this discourse about this white man who is inefficient and incompetent, who is the CEO of ESCO, what has happened is that the rate has become black. So this interview he does with Annika Larson is part of an attempt to rehabilitate him and cleanse him of his blackness. But cleanse whiteness in general mm. of the stain of incompetence and inefficiency. And that's also not to say that there wasn't corruption at ESCOM, which exactly. he probably yes. unearthed. But it's a question of us also having to see two things at once, which we always are saying yes. in our conversations. Because, yes. I, I mean, a funny thing also happened with the director interview, which was that he was attempting to cleanse his own image mm. and disassociate himself from the very obvious collapse of ESCOM under mm. his watch, mm. which he and many others promised us would not happen, at least at the beginning of their tenure. Mm. But then there was an attempt, because the corruption that he pointed out happened under the Ramaphosa administration, there was an attempt not to call it state capture. Mm. So I mm. actually saw a line which said, even though the state capture era has ended, corruption still continues at ESCOM. So there was an attempt not only to extricate Dereta from the mess, but also to cleanse the corruption of its state captureness. Yes. Because it couldn't possibly be state capture under yes. the Ramaphosa presidency. Yes. Now, two things are interesting. Hmm. Now, there's a finding by the Zondo Commission. According to this finding, the ANC supported and enabled state capture. Now, look at the formulation. The formulation is that mm. the ANC supported and enabled state capture. The ANC under Zuma. <laughs> so there are two kinds of ANCs. Mm. Mm. 
the, the ANC under Ramaphosa cannot be guilty of state capture. But the ANC under Zuma can be guilty of mm. state capture. And then there's a further irony. Who are the people who convinced us that the Reita was it? These were ANC leaders. Mm. Absolutely. Now, the fact that they were so wrong about the Reita, mm. and this is the ironic part, mm. Mm. proves that they are black. If we use the logic mm. of whiteness. Mm. And in some ways, I think the Reita was an attempt to use his whiteness to give ESCOM a buffer from public criticism to say we have even brought a competent white man to ESCOM now. You know, what more do you want? And therefore, everyone's public scrutiny went off ESCOM. Well, he must yes. be trying. He must yeah. be bringing his competence somewhere. We, we don't see it, but the competence must be coming somehow. Only for us to realize that, well, just as the Ramaphosa presidency itself, mm. it was built on fumes. Well, and, and maybe that is why the new minister of load shedding, the new minister mm. of mm. Um, electricity mm. or energy should have been white. But he was not going to be white in case mm. like the rate along the way becomes black mm. and betrays the same inherently corrupt um, and base mm. tendencies that supposedly reside only in those who are black. Well, Gogo, the only problem is we have to end this interview now because load shedding is one minute away. So... The, the good thing, though, is that uh, we have been promised. And I think the ANC will work very hard to make, to make sure that this happens before the 2024 election. Um that there will be no load shedding. For me, there will be no load shedding this time next year mm. for one of two reasons. Mm. Because the new minister, ESCOM, and others in the sector have succeeded in tackling the problem of load shedding. Or alternatively, there is no load shedding or we cannot perceive it because things have become so dark that, if, that in the dark, <laughs> we can't see darkness. Hmm. Well, Gogo, thank you so much for a riveting and a wonderful conversation and for all of your time. Um, everyone from the SMWX community, um, thanks you. Togos. Togos. Ayeye.